Greetings, citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful, creepy human being you, and welcome to today's true crime episode. I'm so happy that you are here. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to deal with on the day to day, today, you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the murder of Kirsten Costas. Kirsten was a 15-year-old girl who was stabbed to death outside of her neighbor's home, and the culprit was another 15-year-old girl. This case went on to be very, very publicized, and it's a case that inspired a lot of media, most notably a movie that starred Tori Spelling. It was a Lifetime movie called either Death of a Cheerleader or A Friend to Die For, depending on you know where you were watching it, and it is an incredible incredibly sad case. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. All right, let's go ahead and get into this video. Now, this video is on a case that is notable to me for a couple of reasons. First, it's one of like the very first cases I learned about at a young age. It's one of the ones that stuck with me right from the beginning. And I think it is because I watched the movie Death of a Cheerleader when I was just you know, maybe maybe just like a smidge too young to be watching it. Who's to say? I, I can't say for sure, but I watched like a lot of Lifetime movies back then, so I am certain that I saw it back in that time, and it just kind of weeded itself into the fabric of my brain, and I always sort of knew that it was based on a true story, and I've known about Kirsten's case for quite some time because another reason this case is notable is that I've actually covered it before on this channel. Years ago, I covered this case. I think it's one of the first cases I covered on my channel, if I remember correctly. And when I tell you that that video haunts me, it does, because I just, I truly don't feel like I gave the case the justice it deserves. You know what I mean? Like, not for any reason other than being inexperienced at covering cases at that time. I wasn't very good at researching. I've improved so much since then. When I covered it last time, I watched the movie Death of a Cheerleader during my research, and I feel like it impressed itself upon me a little more than I would have liked, and I just feel like Kirsten's case deserves to be told from this version of me, one that is better at researching and can actually give it what it needs, because I just don't feel like I was able to do that back then because I was ill-equipped, but we all got to start somewhere, I guess. So today I'm going to tell you the entire story. I read all the things so that you do not have to, and at the end of this video I want you to answer the question of the day. I'm going to give it to you now so you can have it kicking around in your brain as we go through the details of this case, but of course I want you to answer when you have something to go on. But the question of the day is this. I actually have two. Well, they're kind of the same, but the question is, what do you think happened to Kirsten that day? Like, What caused this altercation between her and her killer that made them feel like they had to murder this 15-year-old girl? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below after we go through the details of this case. And now, with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the tragic murder of 15-year-old Kirsten Costas. All right, now where to start here? I guess what we can do is we can jump in our handy dandy time machine and we're going to head to June of 1984, which, wow, was almost 40 years ago. I cannot believe that 1984 was almost 40 years ago, but that is the time that this story took place and we are in a place called Orinda, California. So, Orinda, or Orinda? That doesn't sound right. I bet it's Orinda. I mean, you guys will let me know, I know. But Orinda was a place in Contra Costa County that was just east of Berkeley, and it was said to be a great place to live. It was ranked number two in overall friendliness, which I was like, I didn't know that's a thing that... that was ranked, but apparently it is. And it was a place that a lot of well-off families lived because it was in a central area where they could like commute to Oakland or San Francisco to go to work. It was an area that was known to produce like academically excellent students. Like, for example, the graduation rate at the school was almost 100%, which, you know, isn't... I don't want to say it's not totally common, but I feel like we do know that people do be dropping out. People do be getting their GEDs, but not in Orinda. And in Orinda, there was just one high school. It was Maramonte High School. And not only did the school produce little geniuses, but it also produced like NFL players and Olympians. So needless to say, this was a fancy pants place. And this is the place that 15-year-old Kirsten Costas, a girl that was described as cute as a bug's ear and an all-American girl, lived with her family, which was her brother Peter, her father Arthur, who went by Art, and her mother Beret. So on the warm night of June 23rd, 1984, a man named Alex Arnold was inside his home with his wife, Mary Jane. They were unwinding from a night of, you know, entertaining their friends. They had had friends over to play like cards or something. And they hear a knock on their door. It's like 10 p.m. And when they open the door, there's a short little girl there with curly brown hair. And this was Kirsten Costas. 
she tells Alex Arnold like, hey, uh, I was over there or over there. I was nearby parked in a car at a church with a friend of mine and she quote, went weird. So I would like to use your phone please so I can call my parents because I would like to go home. So Kirsten seemed upset, but not scared or anything. So Alex, you know, let her in the house, let her use the phone. And when she called her, family didn't answer. They had left that night to go to a potluck for her brother's baseball game, I believe, and they hadn't gotten home yet. In learning that Kirsten's parents weren't home yet, Alex Arnold offered to give her a ride. And she said that like, yes, she would accept and that he could just drop her off at a neighbor's house since, you know, her family wasn't there and she didn't want to be alone. So with that, Alex and Kirsten loaded into his car to head towards Kirsten's home. And when they did that, Alex's wife, Mary Jane, noted that a small car that had been parked at the end of their driveway followed Alex and Kirsten as they left. Alex also noted the beat up looking yellowish orange Pinto that was following behind them. And he mentioned to Kirsten and she said that, yes, that was the car that her and her friend had been in. That was her friend's car, but not to worry. Like everything was fine. Anyways, they get to Kirsten's neighbor's house and she gets out to walk over to the door with Alex waiting in the car to make sure she got into the house safe, which that's something a good ass person does. When I tell you, please make sure your friends get into places safe. Make sure your friends text you when they get home so that you know that they've gotten to their home or their location safe because it is just so important, you know, but unfortunately in this case, doing that did not save Kirsten. Kirsten made her way to her neighbor's porch. And as she did, Alex, the guy who's waiting in the car for her, obviously sees another young girl pass by him on the right, like on the right side of his car headed towards the porch where Kirsten was. So Kirsten's there. She's knocking on the door to get to safety when she is attacked right there on her neighbor's porch. Alex sees this. He sees this other young girl attacking Kirsten and he thinks what he's seeing is like a fist fight. He sees Kirsten, like he hears Kirsten scream rather. He sees her fall to the ground and he sees the other girl's arm going up and down over and over thinking that she's like hitting her, but later learning that she had been stabbing her. He said the next thing he saw was Kirsten get up and start to run. And when he looked back up onto the porch where the other girl was, she was just standing there with a red colored object in her hand. And the next thing he knew, the Pinto revved up and started to drive away. He said at this point, he followed the Pinto. He wanted to see like where they were going, what was going on, wanted to see if he could catch the person driving essentially and followed for about a quarter mile before he like lost the car and realized that he should be getting back to Kirsten anyway. But by the time he got back to the house where she had been attacked, Kirsten was unconscious in the arms of another person. So at the same time that Kirsten had been stabbed, at the same time she was being attacked, a man named Arthur, not her father, same name, but different man, had been standing in his kitchen. I think he was like washing dishes or something when he heard a blood curdling scream. So he booked it out front. And when he did, he saw Kirsten, this girl that he had known her entire life. I think he knew her from like the time she was born. He sees her staggering across his yard. And he said he could tell immediately because of how she was crying and the way she was moving, that something horrible had happened happened. Arthur ran to Kirsten, who by this point he could see was heavily bleeding. And she cried out to him, quote, help me, help me. I've been stabbed before collapsing into his arms and just, you know, losing consciousness. He could see that blood was gushing out of the five wounds that were in her upper body. And when he like tore open her shirt to try to, you know, put, do press, do chest compressions and try to stop the bleeding, it was just like gushing out of her. So he tries to speak to her. He tries to ask her like, who did this to you? But by this point she was in shock. So all he could do was try to slow down the bleeding and actually pray with her. He also attempted to perform life-saving measures on her until paramedics arrived because when all of this was happening, one of his sons did dial 911. Now, while all of this is happening, the paramedics arrive, Kirsten's parents actually arrive to their home on Orchard Road. And normally the neighborhood's super quiet, but now it's buzzing with cops everywhere and paramedics, and they can see that their daughter is in the back of an ambulance. So her dad, Arthur, jumps out of the car and runs to be with her, and her mother, Bray, just sits in the car frozen, not able to do anything. Kirsten ended up being rushed to Kaiser Hospital in Walnut Creek, where unfortunately she died as a result of her numerous stab wounds that had hit not only her lungs, but it also bisected a major artery to her heart. And this was just a month shy of her 16th birthday. She was gone and her killer, another 15 year old girl named Bernadette Prati had just gone home, washed the murder weapon, put it away, and then went on a walk with her mom and their dog like nothing had ever 
happened. And what's wild here is despite the fact that there were so many witnesses, there were people who saw Bernadette's, people who saw Bernadette's car, somebody who even spoke to Bernadette that night, it would take months for an arrest to be made. So let's now go back. Let's talk about Kirsten. Let's talk about Bernadette. Let's talk about how they came to be involved in each other's lives. And then we'll move through the case. So Kirsten, Kirsten Marina Costas was born on July 23rd, 1968, and was said to be, quote, an all-American girl, the kind any mother and father would be proud of. She was neat, lots of personality, bubbly. She loved being a girl. She was vivacious, happy. Kirsten's mother described her as the energy of the home, where most of the rest of the family was quieter, more reserved. Kirsten just simply was not like that. She was very full of personality and she made her presence known. She was always talking to friends, listening to music, dancing around. She was full of life and vibrancy. Kirsten had a ton of friends and they would describe her as witty, confident, outgoing, sarcastic. She was kind of like the it girl in that area at that time. She came from a family with money, so she was always up to date and able to afford like the nicest new clothes, whatever was in fashion, the accessories. She always looked really put together and was like hip with what was new. And she was also very pretty, so that definitely didn't hurt. But she was also philanthropic. She was part of this group called the Bobolinks, an exclusive volunteer group with like sorority vibes, and the members were called the Bobbies. And they were essentially a group from several high schools that held various events like car washes and cake sales to raise money for the uh, Mount Diablo Therapy Center. All the girls in this group were like top achievers from good homes, and they were only able to be accepted into this group if they were able to show that they were the type of girls to get things done. And that described Kirsten to a T. She was a member of the cheerleading squad and the swim team, both things that she excelled at. She was also one that played soccer and she worked in the school office. She did skiing and she did jazz dancing, like jazz dancing, jazz music, jazz. She did jazz. One friend who took jazz lessons with her at Walnut Creek Ballet Center said that she was good at everything and focused so hard at all the things that she did. She didn't have a boyfriend because she didn't want one, but instead just focused on her schooling and extracurriculars, being super excited to go to Miramonte High School in the fall and wanted to join the varsity cheerleading squad. And on top of that, by most people's standards, she was a good person. She had a good personality. She was very friendly and vibrant. Not everyone thought that about her, or at least not everyone said that they thought that about her because one person really seemed to have a pretty big issue with Kirsten, and this was her murderer, Bernadette Prati. And it didn't really seem that Bernadette had an issue with Kirsten in that she didn't like her. If anything, it seems like she liked her quite a bit and had this deep desire within her to have Kirsten accept her and to be her friend. But in her estimation, Kirsten didn't really give her the time of day and didn't think much of her. And she definitely didn't know just how much Bernadette thought of her. So Bernadette Prati, she was the youngest child of a large family and she was born on September 20th, 1968. She came from a hardworking family and they lived in the same, you know, prestigious county as Kirsten, but her family was just different. Things, you know, didn't come as easily for the Prati's in Bernadette's eyes. Her father was a retired public works officer who taught Christian class to high school students in his spare time. And her mother was a homemaker. So even though they had their own home and worked super hard to give the kids anything they could ever need, they weren't able to give them anything they could ever want, right? And this really weighed on Bernadette, probably for a couple of reasons, I'd imagine. One, the age that she was, right? She was 15, that's when you really wanna fit in and living in such a, you know, rich area with lots of kids who can literally have anything they want anytime they want, it would be kind of hard to be in a position where you were not able to do that. Or rather that your parents were not able to provide that, right? Because it seems that for Bernadette, public perception was like the most important thing to her. And being surrounded by all of these rich kids with their rich parents and their nice houses, even though she had all of that, right? Like, I'm sure her family was way better off than like anyone I know right now in my life, she felt kind of alien around them. Because again, this was Arinda, and this is a place where everybody just seemed to be 
kind of shiny, you know? Nobody was filthy rich, but everybody was pretty well off and middle class really just wasn't what Arinda was about at that time. And you take that and you combine it with the fact that Bernadette had her own inner shit going on, right? She's 15, she's insecure, she's feeling unpopular and unliked and undesirable, and it just caused her to be a little bit bitter towards life in general overall. So anyways, Bernadette had been attending a parochial school, parochial school? It's like a religious school, which made sense since her family was God-fearing and all that, but she had recently transferred to Miramonte High, which is where Kirsten went. And she did well there, you know what I mean? Bernadette fit in pretty well. She didn't come, she wasn't a casualty of being like a new kid in a new school in that she didn't have like a clique of friends to easily go into, which is true. I mean, she didn't have a clique of friends because she was new, but she easily webbed herself in with the cool kids. She was in the in crowd, as they say, and she had like a lot of friends. At least when it came to like the girls, she had a lot of female friends. She didn't really hit it off with the guys. They weren't interested in her like that. They didn't like, she wasn't going on dates or anything like that with one guy actually saying in an interview after all of this happened that <laughs> it was, oh my God, that Bernadette was not pretty enough or outgoing enough like Kirsten was. She was just like an ordinary looking girl. To which I say, ouch. Most of the stuff people say about Bernadette after the fact, I'm like, considering the type of personality she had, it would all be like so incredibly hurtful to her. But anyways, Bernadette, she had good grades. She was involved in extracurriculars, like being a member of the Bobolinks, just like Kirsten. She was on the track team. She was the local babysitter and all the parents loved her. But for whatever reason, she just never thought that was the case. It's like she couldn't see her actual position in life and always thought she was in a worse situation than she was. And a classmate of hers named Chris even said of this quote, Bernadette was accepted and popular in her own way, but she had this obsession with being liked. I could never understand why she thought she wasn't. Which man, I don't know why, but that line, when I was looking into this case, that's the line that got to me. I could never understand why she thought she wasn't. Because it really just shows that we are our own worst critics, like by far. And unfortunately, it would get worse because the girl who's already feeling inferior, she was already feeling like a failure next to her peers or in comparison or in compared to, the, she thought she sucked. You know what I mean? She started experiencing actual failures that she had never experienced before in life. First, she wanted to be on the yearbook staff, but she was not selected. Then she was rejected for the like prestigious Atlantis Club, which I don't really know what that is. It sounds to be sea related, right? Atlantis, King Triton, the water. I don't know. But the most important thing, the thing that was most devastating to her is that she really, really wanted to be on the cheerleading squad, but she was not selected. This was pretty heartbreaking to her. A friend of hers named Jessica, who had gotten to see her devastation to learning she had not been chosen as cheerleader, said specifically of Bernadette's temperament at learning this, quote, she worked hard for cheerleader. She came up to me afterward and said, I didn't make it and I can't believe it. She was really disappointed. I guess being a cheerleader in this area was a super big thing. And I don't know if it was just this area or if this was like a 1980s thing, but apparently it was like humongous to be a cheerleader. Like before you could even be considered to try out, you had to write an essay to let them know how you would be an asset as a cheerleader. Your parents had to agree that they would buy the outfits and send you to cheerleading camp, which would cost $500. And that's $500 in 1980s money, which just sounds like so many dollars. I didn't do the conversion, but I'm sure it's a lot. And then if you got through all that and they were going to judge you and decide if you were actually going to get to be a cheerleader, they would have a whole ass ceremony where you would do this thing in front of all these judges and you'd be up on like a stage. It was just like in movies when somebody's being chosen as like prom queen, where they would pull your name out of an envelope and make it this whole ordeal and give you flowers and applause. It was just weird to me. I find that so strange. Maybe it's just because I would, I would, you know, I wasn't the type to do that I was the kid, you know what I was the kid? I was the kid that when you would give me a ballot to like choose who should be class president, I would flip it over and be like, I will not take part in this popularity contest. And I would send it back every time. I was that piece of shit kid. <laughs> but the fact is it was a huge deal. So when Bernadette was not selected as a cheerleader and Kirsten was being described as quote, the perfect cheerleader, this was a humongous blow to her especially because she really liked Kirsten or at least idolized her. Kirsten kind of represented all the things that Bernadette wanted to be, but wasn't. And for whatever reason, the two just didn't click. Bernadette said specifically of this quote, 
she never liked me. The thing that got me mad was it hurt. Bernadette said that Kirsten never liked her and bullied her in a sort of passive aggressive way. Like she wasn't the type who would ever come out and say anything mean to her, not, not look at her and be like, you're ugly or anything like that. But she would just make little comments that would make Bernadette feel bad about herself. And she gave an example of one of these instances when she and Kirsten had been on a school ski trip, which a school ski trip, you know, this area has money if they're going on a school ski trip. But anyways, they're there and Bernadette says that she's already feeling a little bit uncomfortable around all the kids that are there because they're all there with their brand new skis and their brand new equipment. And Bernadette wasn't able to get new equipment. She had spent the entire summer working and saving money so that she could buy some older used equipment. So she was feeling self-conscious about this, but was still having fun regardless. But she says that during this trip, Kirsten had come up to her and sort of made a comment about the condition of her equipment and that it just made her feel bad about herself. And she said specifically of this quote, it just seemed like everyone else was thinking that, but she was the only one who would ever come out and say that. Which listen, that's a bummer. Okay. Like if that's true, it is. And I know there are, are a lot of people out there that sympathize with Bernadette and that is fine. But a lot of people out there also villainize Kirsten. And that is not fine in my opinion, because listen, bullying is never okay obviously, but to villainize a 15 year old child who was stabbed to death is wrong in my opinion and weird, especially because we were not there. We don't really know what happened. Maybe Kirsten said something that to her in her mind wasn't meant to sound mean, but a sensitive Bernadette took it as such, or maybe Kirsten was teasing her. But what I can say is that in doing my research in this case, I didn't really see anyone else say that Kirsten was mean except Bernadette. Even this girl named Nancy Kane, who we're going to talk about more later in the video, a girl who ended up being blamed by a lot of people for Kirsten's murder after the fact, before Bernadette was arrested, people thought she may be involved. She said that one, all kids are mean at some point. So maybe there was a time that Kirsten could have been seen as mean or snotty or self-righteous, but that the people in that area were sort of brought up to believe they were better than everyone else. She said that she even felt that way, but she also added that she didn't like Kirsten, but didn't see her as mean as much as she saw her as cocky. She said that Kirsten had a lot of self-esteem because she was the type of person that was good at everything. And that kind of personality can just rub people the wrong way sometimes. Anyway, sorry, I got off on a thing. I just like have a lot of trouble when I see people talking shit about a dead child, like hello. Cause I covered this case before and I saw a lot of comments like that. And I'm just like, okay, feel bad for Bernadette. If you want to, that is your choice, but maybe, maybe feel worse for the murdered child. I don't know. And you know what, speaking of her being murdered, let's now move forward and talk about what happened here. So Kirsten was murdered on June 23rd, but what, took place to sort of get the ball moving. You'll understand what I'm saying when I get there. Cause the sentence I've, it's gone off the rails a little bit, but we, it started a little bit earlier. And this was on Thursday, June 21st, when a call came into Kirsten's home. It was about 10 PM when the phone rang and the call was for Kirsten, sort of. Kirsten wasn't home at the time. She was away at cheerleading camp, I believe, which was something that the girl on the line knew. Okay. But, um, because Kirsten wasn't there, her mother Beret took the phone call. The girl on the line was Bernadette, but of course she didn't identify herself. She just said like, hi, this is a friend of Kirsten's. I'm calling to let you know that there is a secret meeting. There's going to be a secret dinner for the Bobolinks on Saturday night. And Kirsten needs to be there. The person on the line, Bernadette said over and over that like, this was a secret. It was a secret meeting. Please don't tell anyone. And she said over and over to Beret, don't tell Kirsten, don't tell Kirsten I called. She then told her, she then told Beret that she would be there on Saturday night. She would come and she would pick Kirsten up. So just to have her ready and waiting outside. Now the call was definitely weird. It hit Beret as weird, but she was kind of like, you know what? Kids are fucking weird sometimes. I don't know what to say. So she didn't think much of it. And the next day when Kirsten came home, she told her about, you know, the call, the secret dinner, all that jazz. And Kirsten planned to go. Saturday, June 23rd came and Kirsten got ready for her secret meeting, her secret dinner with the Bobolinks and her parents, her mom, her dad, and her brother had left to go to a potluck for Peter's like baseball team because he was in school. He had a baseball team. They were having a potluck. So she's there. She's getting ready. Her mom calls the house. Bray calls the house to tell her like to have a good time and to remember to turn the porch light off before she left. And that would be the last time she would ever speak to her daughter. 
While this was happening, Bernadette was being driven by her father to a house that was not far from hers because she told her family she was going to be babysitting that night. She was able to convince her father to leave the car with her, even though she didn't have a license yet. She wasn't going to drive or anything. She just wanted to have the car parked in the driveway because then anybody who was coming by would think there was an adult there, so she would just feel safe. So her father agreed, left the car there, and he walked back home since it wasn't very far. After that, Bernadette got into the car and headed to pick Kirsten up at her house. And now this is what Bernadette says happened that night. So Kirsten came outside to be picked up, and that's when she found out that the mystery caller who was going to come and pick her up and take her to this, you know, fancy dinner, the secret dinner for the Bobolinks, was actually Bernadette. And even though Bernadette claimed that, you know, Kirsten did not like her, she says Kirsten did get in the car. The two drove off, and once they were together and they were driving, obviously, because they were driving off in the car. This is when Bernadette told Kirsten that there actually was no secret dinner for the Bobolinks, and instead there was a house party that the two were going to go to, and Bernadette said the reason she wanted to take Kirsten to this house party is because she believed that the two spending time together in this atmosphere would make it so that they were finally friends. And about this party, I remember the first time I covered this case being unsure if there even was a party that night going on, because I thought it might just be a lie altogether. Well, it turns out that is not the case, investigators were able to confirm there was a party taking place, but I do remain unconvinced that Bernadette ever planned to go there just because of the way she was dressed. She was wearing like old faded sweatpants and a big t-shirt, and that just doesn't seem like the type of thing a 15-year-old girl would wear, especially a 15-year-old girl like Bernadette, where perception was basically everything. And I mean, don't get me wrong. If I was invited to a party right here, right now, I probably could see myself showing up in sweatpants and a t-shirt, but I am looking at it from the perspective of 35-year-old Brittany, not 15-year-old Brittany, because 15-year-old Brittany wouldn't be caught dead, not dolled up. You know what I mean? And I mean, it is possible that she dressed down because she was lying about where she was going. She told her parents that she was going to be babysitting, but I don't know. I remain convinced semi-convinced. I lean towards the idea that Bernadette was never planning to go to that party, personally. Anyways, the two were driving along. Bernadette gives Kirsten this information, and reportedly Kirsten was a little bit weirded out because she was lied to to get out of the house, but ultimately ended up agreeing to go to this party. But she said on the way, she wanted to stop. She wanted to pull over to smoke a little weed. Now, this is what Bernadette says happened, and this is something that her family flat out disagrees that this would ever happen. They think it's bullshit. I don't know where I lean. I do think it's very possible that a 15 year old girl could be smoking weed and lying to her parents about it. But I also think it's possible that Bernadette's a liar. So anyways, she said the two drove over to a church parked in the parking lot and that Kirsten started to smoke some weed and that she then offered it over to Bernadette, but Bernadette refused. She didn't want to smoke. And this situation, this refusal for Bernadette to smoke weed, she says started an argument where the two started kind of going back and forth and it led to Kirsten being kind of over it and choosing to get out of the car. This is when Kirsten ended up at the home of Alex and Mary Jane Arnold, who had just been at their house playing cribbage or pinochle, depending on which report you read, which are those the same thing? I don't know what either of those things are, but they were playing it with friends that night. Kirsten tells Alex that she had been hanging out with a friend. They were hanging out in her car when all of a sudden her friend got weird on her and that she wanted to call her mom because she wanted to go home. And while Alex and Kirsten are having this conversation, his wife, Mary Jane, looks past them and sees that at the end of their driveway, there is a girl with, quote, a roundish face and light brown hair standing there wearing a yellow shirt and faded red sweatpants. So as I said before, Kirsten tried to call. Her parents weren't home, so Alex agreed to give Kirsten a ride to her neighbor's house, and when they left, Bernadette followed behind in her car, and while she was driving, she happened to notice there was a knife in the car. Alex gets Kirsten to the neighbor's house. Reportedly, this was a woman named Renee, at least according to an interview with a woman named Sharon. Renee was a good friend of Kirsten's family and knew her very well, so she gets out to go to this house, and Alex watches to make sure she gets there safe. Now, apparently Renee, the woman whose house this was that knew Kirsten, heard the knocking on her door when Kirsten started to bang, but she didn't know it was Kirsten because like her own mother, she assumed, she thought that Kirsten was at a dinner with the Bobbies because again, they, you know, close neighborhood, they all knew each other. So she thought that Kirsten was out at dinner, didn't think it would be her. So when she heard the knocking, she didn't answer the door because it was dark and she was home alone and she was scared. So she ended up not coming out until she ended up hearing ambulances later. And these ambulances were responding to Kirsten because Bernadette had attacked her. She had followed her onto that porch where she was trying to go in and get safety. And she had grabbed this big ass kitchen knife, like this giant butcher's knife before getting out of her car and had stabbed her 
over and over while she screamed. And though Kirsten was able to get to another neighbor's house and they were able to perform life-saving measures, she ended up dying as a result of these multiple stab wounds. From there, Bernadette drove home and she calmly washed the knife, put it away, and walked her dog with her mom. And she says all the while she had no idea she had killed Kirsten. She thought she had only hurt her. So that night was restless for her, just waiting for the police to show up at her door because she was sure Kirsten would have told police who did this and they were going to be coming for her. But nobody ever showed up. And the next day while she was at school, she learned from a friend that Kirsten had died. Now, this murder was devastating to the community. Arinda was a close, tight-knit area where everybody knew each other. So within no time, Kirsten's family was enveloped in love and support with people showing up with food and condolences. And a family friend said of the murder, quote, This is something that just doesn't happen here. There is no rhyme or reason. It is so bizarre. It is so beyond belief. Now, people wanted justice for this girl, and they wanted it quick. Within no time, a reward fund was set up, and it was actually set up by um, Arthur Hillman, the guy who was trying to save Kirsten, who, you know, that she basically died in his arms. He set up this fund, and they went out and, you know, made flyers and circulated them everywhere. They wanted any and all information they could find they could get to bring her killer in and they ended up getting the rewards like fifty thousand dollars that's because one person don't know who this was it was an anonymous um contributor gave thirty thousand dollars towards the kirsten costas fund hundreds of people attended kirsten's memorial service friends family members teachers people from the community who had never even met her and one of these friends who showed up at her funeral was actually bernadette Prati, who was reportedly in hysterics. And to this I say, if you murder me, don't come to my funeral. What the fuck? But during this time, Bernadette was just out there in the world acting like nothing had happened. No one suspected her, and all the while police are struggling to find answers as to who killed Kirsten Costas. All they knew is that they were looking for a, quote, chunky girl with stringy blonde hair. And when I read that, you read that everywhere. Well, I read this everywhere. Can you imagine a girl like Bernadette reading that the person that they're looking for, the description people gave of her was a chunky blonde with stringy blonde hair? Oh my God. Now, luckily, investigators actually had a lot to work with here. They had several people who saw Kirsten. They saw her killer. They saw the car. They saw the attack. There was Alex who, you know, drove her home and saw the attack. There was Alex's wife who saw the killer at the end of the driveway. And there was even Alex's neighbor, a friend of his who I haven't even mentioned yet, who saw Kirsten, who spoke to Kirsten when she came to talk on the phone to her parents, and who spoke to Bernadette at the scene. Now, his name was Patrick, and he had talked to Kirsten a little bit when she came to call her parents, and she told him the same thing, that her friend had gotten weird and that she just wanted to get out of the situation. And after having that conversation, or it might have been before having that conversation, that same night, Patrick had also seen a Pinto sitting there with a young girl behind the wheel, and he went over to see if the driver was okay or needed help, and she said she was fine, she was just having trouble starting her car. So he literally had a conversation with her. He had looked her in the face, and they still couldn't find this girl. And there was also another guy. This was a 16-year-old named guy, actually, G-U-Y, because remember that used to be a name? Remember Never Been Kissed? This was a name guy, quite a guy. You are such a guy, right? So he was 16 years old, and he lived near Kirsten and had heard this blood-curdling scream, and he was in his house. By the time he made himself outside, made himself outside, made his way outside, he saw Kirsten there being helped, like laying in the arms, getting life-saving measures performed on her. But he said of what he saw at that time, quote, she was bleeding so bad it coated her shirt. Now I wanna say real quick here that I'm noticing how quickly I am speaking. I get comments all the time of people saying that I talk too fast. And it's like when I get passionate, le passion makes me quick and I can't help it. Can you imagine how long my videos would be if I talked at like the speed at which some of you would prefer? Nobody, nobody has time for that. But also, if you want that to be, you can actually slow me down. If you look at, you can slow me down. I can't slow me down. But anyways, despite having all of that, all of the things I just mentioned, police were still having such a hard time coming up specifically with who may have done this to Kirsten. They looked into it. They interviewed more than 100 girls because they were focusing on like young girls. They interviewed over 100 girls. They looked into all the people Kirsten knew at school, all the people she knew socially outside of school. And every single thing they looked into came up a dead end. 
Now, police did seem to focus on two specific students initially, of course, both alt kids, one that was into punk and one that was into metal. And this definitely made the kids at school really focus on these two girls, which was unfortunate because truth be told, every blonde girl at the school was getting reamed. They just were. But no one seemed to get it quite as bad as one of these two girls, and her name was Nancy, and she's somebody I mentioned a little bit earlier. So Nancy and Kirsten didn't really like each other. They didn't really run in the same circle. They were both from like well-off families, obviously, like Nancy's dad was a doctor, but Nancy had gotten into being a little bit of an alt kid. She had a darker look because she thought it was cool. She wasn't goth or anything though. They describe her as goth, but she liked Madonna and New Wave and Flock of Seagulls and all that, but she cut her hair and dyed it differently and dressed differently and just stopped talking to the popular kids. And that included Kirsten. But the thing is, is though she had this look to her, she was like a normal girl. She was a horse girl, actually. She just had good taste in music. But because she dressed differently and because she liked dark things and she cut her hair weird, obviously they thought she must perhaps be a murderer, <laughs> which is just so dumb. But we see this sometimes. Like, how dare you be just a little cooler than the average bear? I don't know what to tell you. I might be biased. I am biased. But dude, the accusations against Nancy were unrelenting from the kids to the police. It got so bad that her mom had her refuse to take a lie detector test, then pulled her out of school and moved her to a new school so she could just get a little bit of relief from the constant accusations. But this ended up being a bad thing. And it was the police's fault. I'm not going to lie. This one was the cop's fault because they had like zoned in on her so hard. And then when she didn't take the lie detector test and moved, they saw this as an admission of guilt and it made it worse. They literally like looked at her until the moment Bernadette became like the suspect in their mind, they were like, it's Nancy. And she was just blown away because she was like, people really think I could kill someone. But I mean, it isn't really a Shyamalan twist for us here because Bernadette's the one that did it, right? But they just don't know that yet. So I guess it, it ended up being a Shyamalan twist for them. And it's just wild to me that they had no idea because like she even had the same type of car that police were looking for. They knew she had this Pinto. They're looking for this Pinto. They knew she had a Pinto. Everyone knew she had a Pinto or her family did rather, but no one suspected her because she was like the last person you would think would do something like this. And she seemed to be just upset about Kirsten's murder as everyone else. Police chased this Pinto dude. They conducted more than 300 interviews, investig investigated, investigated more than a thousand leads and examined 750 Pintos. And they were focusing on students specifically at the school and even talked to Bernadette, but did not suspect her. She took a lie detector test and she gave them an alibi saying she had been babysitting that night, just like she told her parents. And because that's what she told her parents, her mom corroborated that. I mean, her dad dropped her off at the house. There is no reason for her not to believe that that's where her daughter was. And because Bernadette didn't give them off like the murderer vibe, they didn't look into her alibi right away. And they didn't seem concerned when her, her results for her lie detector test came back inconclusive. They thought she seemed on the up and up. They said she seemed calm and it, it, she just didn't ring any alarm bells because they assumed that because their killer was a young girl, they knew this. They believed, they knew this. They didn't believe this. They knew this. I mean, unless it was like three raccoons in a trench coat. I don't know what to tell you, but they, they knew it was a young girl and they believed that if they were interviewing the young girl who had done this, that they would have had an extreme emotional response and Bernadette just didn't. Now, as far as theories, I don't really know what the police thought while they were investigating this. I didn't see any reports of their theories around this, but I don't feel like that's very common that they come out with theories. You know what I mean? Um, but Kirsten's parents did because after two and a half months, there was a break with the kids out of school. And once the kids went back to school, her parents were worried. They were worried because all these kids were going back to school and they believed that they were walking the halls with their daughter's murderer. So Kirsten's family, her father came out and was like, listen, I think that this is somebody in the school and I have my theory that it's more than one person. He believed that this was like a group of girls who had gotten together to do this and maybe it wasn't something that they planned, but that the whole thing had just gotten out of hand. He said that he believed it was a combined effort that they had planned it and knew how to get her out of the house and knew Kirsten and believed that a group was hiding it. And he said that many people locally felt the same way. And he said that he didn't know what the motive was exactly, but he figured it was probably jealousy or maybe a sort of anti-establishment mindset where Kirsten represented the establishment. And I think this was leaning towards the whole like goth and punk thing, honestly, because the police had kind of pushed that. So it makes sense that her family would think that as well. 
Some people thought it also could be like somebody who was anti-Bobby who had a problem with the bobblings because they thought it was possible that Kirsten wasn't even like the target because another girl came forward and said she received a similar call, but that she didn't come because she knew that the group's leader was out of town so that it was bullshit and it was a prank call. But obviously Kirsten was, I don't know what that other girl was talking about because obviously Kirsten was the target here. We know that. The principal of the high school, who was also one of Kirsten's neighbors, I think was closest to the motive when he said that Kirsten was a quote, good, solid student, very popular, a well-liked kid, but I guess everyone has someone who might be jealous of them. For six months, police had no idea who killed Kirsten Costas. And this was a shock because truthfully, police believed that they'd have an arrest like the very next day, considering all the witnesses that they had. But as time marched on, as the days turned into weeks and the weeks turned into months, people had growing anxiety. Kids were scared. They weren't going out alone. They were going out in groups. Kids were sleeping like in their parents' room or sometimes in their parents' beds. Parents weren't letting their kids go out alone because they were like, listen, if this girl who was so popular and so loved could be murdered like this, who's to say? So you remember how Bernadette had an alibi for the night of the murder saying she had been out babysitting and because of how many leads they were following because of how many girls they were looking into, Bernadette's had not been looked into like her alibi hadn't been confirmed because they were, she wasn't a priority on their list. Well, this went unchecked for a while. That was until Kirsten's family actually hired a private investigator to look into the case for themselves. They were getting tired of waiting. They had the money. They were like, can you please, you know, help expedite the situation? So this PI started looking into the case files and looking into dropped leads, like things that weren't getting looked into fast enough. And that's when this PI discovered that Bernadette had lied about her alibi. And when they spoke to the family, the Bernadette said she had been babysitting for, they were like, absolutely not. She hasn't worked for us in like a year. So this PI brought this information to the police. And when they heard that, they were kind of like, Huh. Because around that time, they were also just getting a psychological profile on the person who killed Kirsten. So not every case gets a psychological profile, but I believe because of the high profile nature of the case and also the amount of money that Kirsten's family and also the area had, the FBI did get involved and put together a psychological profile on who the killer of Kirsten Costas would be. It took a while, obviously, for this to be completed. But once it was, it was a 10 page document with great great details with great, great details that went into great detail about who Kirsten's killer would be. It stated that Kirsten's killer was likely a girl around the same age as Kirsten and most likely knew her due to the intimate nature of the stabbing. And it also said that the person responsible wouldn't appear remorseful. And this was shocking because again, police assumed their suspect would break during questioning and they had interviewed Bernadette before, but she seemed so calm. So they assumed she wasn't involved when really now they knew that this profile put it together and they were like, wow, like it probably is her because she literally wasn't emotional at all. And the agent responsible for this, the um, agent responsible for the profile, this was agent Hilly, didn't just create a profile. He came to Orinda. He started looking at the case file. He did new interviews and he was the one who told local police that they should bring Bernadette back in. So she was, she was brought back in and she was interviewed by agent Hilly specifically. And during this interview, he went over the psychological profile with her. And after he did, she said quietly, quote, it sounds just like me. She then asked what would happen to Kirsten's killer when they were caught and prison was mentioned. And Bernadette responded that she believed that the public humiliation of people knowing that they were responsible, that the person who did this, that she, right, was responsible would be worse than prison. And then she asked to go home. And I just cannot imagine being in that interview room because it seems so clear that she did it. Like that profile was so effective. It was so specific. That profile was the single most important thing. Like obviously after all of the hard work the local police did, but it was the single most important thing that brought them to a suspect. And even the local police said like, this was vital for them. Once they read that profile, they were just like, this fits this girl more than anyone. So after this interview with the FBI, Bernadette started to crack. It was like she knew. She knew they were closing in on her. She knew that her time was running out. And I think the guilt was getting to her. I do think she felt guilty. I'll, I'll say that. I do think she felt bad about what she did. And she started to write. She started to write about how she felt. And one of her writings was retrieved later, you know, after she was arrested. And she had basically written down a list of her feelings around this time that said, quote, one, I have caused a lot of hurt and pain to a lot of people. Two, I don't want to hurt people anymore. 
Three, I want to go to heaven when I die. Four, I regret what I did. Five, I can't bring Kirsten back or change time. Six, if I kill myself, I will hurt people even more, my family. I think I could kill myself. I would go to hell if I killed myself. I would rather kill myself than go on living if people knew. Although it's incredible, my parents are saints who would forgive and love me. During this time, also Bernadette, who we know is a religious person, right? She went to a religious school and her father also taught like Bible study and all that jazz or Bible class, Christian class to high school kids, right? She went to church and she actually confessed to the murder to a priest. And I guess priests, if I understand correctly, are exempt from having to like give that information to police, which I don't think I agree with. <laughs> right? I've talked about that before. I think it's kind of dumb, but he or she, they, I don't know if women can be priests. You guys will let me know for sure. I know. Uh, the priest told her to tell her parents. So on the evening of December 10th, she tried to, she went to her mom and she told her mom that she wanted to talk to her about something, but her mom was super tired. So she's like, yes, we will. But let me just like take a quick nap first and everything will be cool. And then we will talk. But then this short nap, napped, nap turned into a whole ass sleep where she slept through like the whole night. So the next morning she wakes up, she's like, oh shit, we were supposed to talk. But by this time, Bernadette didn't have time to talk because she was leaving the school. Her mom apologized and was like, you know, I want to talk. I'm so sorry. And Bernadette was like, it's fine. No big deal. I wrote you a letter and it's sitting on the counter. She told her mom, like, it's cool if you read it, but can you just do me a solid? And her mom's like, yes, what is that solid? And she's like, can you wait an hour? I'm going to leave, wait one hour and then read the letter. And her mom actually complied. I feel like my mom would have been like, yeah. And as soon as I walked out the door, she would have read it, but her mom didn't. She set a kitchen timer. She sat down with her Bible. She did a little Bible reading, researching, studying, if you will. And when the timer went off, she picked up the letter to read it. And I cannot imagine what her mom must have been going through in this moment because the letter is heartbreaking. The letter read, quote, Dear mom and dad, I have been trying to tell you this all day, but I love you so much. It's too hard. So I'm taking the easy way out. The FBI man thinks I did it. And he is right. I've been able to live with it for a while, but I can't ignore it. It's too much for me. And I can't be that deceiving. Please still love me. I can't live unless you love me. I ruin my life and yours and I don't know what to do. And I'm ashamed and scared. Then at the bottom, she wrote, quote, please don't say how could you or why? Cause I don't understand this. And I don't know why. Now her mother was pretty devastated as I'm sure you can imagine because like she had no idea. Bernadette had been acting totally fine since the murder she had been studying and like practicing for her confirmation with the church. She swam, she hung with friends. She went to Kirsten's funeral. She went to the Sleepy Hollow Swim Club, which sounds spooky, but I'm sure it's not. And while there, the girls were all talking about how terrible the person who did this to Kirsten must have been. Well, all the girls with Bernadette because Bernadette just sat there quietly. She had gotten elected as the secretary of the service organization that she and Kirsten had both belonged to. And she had even started going on dates. She seemed so, so unaffected later saying that she was just really good at blocking out what happened. And that's why she could like get through her days so normally because this just didn't feel real to her. It's just one of those things that's like, damn. And her mother just like, couldn't believe it. So she called the school at this point and told them that she was going to be picking up her daughter. And she did. And she said she didn't call the police right away because she, she just wanted to spend some time with her daughter. She just wanted to be with her when things were still as normal as they were going to be before everything changed. She said she didn't even want to talk to her. She just wanted to be with her. Then she told her husband and later that day, she and her parents went to the police department and asked to speak with agent Hilly. She then made a full confession. She told him about the call she made to lure her out. She told him about the party. She told him about the church parking lot and the dumb argument over weed. And she said it wasn't even an argument so much, just that Kirsten didn't think it was a big deal to smoke weed and Bernadette didn't want to. And that Kirsten's reaction to Bernadette not wanting to just made her feel dumb. Now for the record, I didn't see anything by the way that said that proved that weed was involved. Like I didn't see any reports that showed Kirsten had marijuana or THC or whatever in her system. And the only proof that there would have been was from Bernadette. Cause she said that Kirsten had left a baggie of weed in her car when she got out, but that she had taken it home and had flushed it. 
Bernadette said that this wasn't premeditated, that she did not plan to kill Kirsten, even though she had this big ass knife with her. Because if you're like me, you're probably like, what about that big ass knife, bro? Because it was like a giant butcher's knife. And she said that her sister, Virginia, who went by Gina, often took the car um, with her to work and she would eat her lunch in her car. So she would take this knife this big butcher's knife to cut up vegetables. An 18 inch butcher's knife to cut up tomatoes and shit in her car for her lunch. Which I don't know, I feel like if I was a cop, I would be side-eyeing the shit out of that explanation. She said during this confession that it was all too much, her life, her perceived failures. And she said specifically of this quote, I lost for cheerleader and I didn't get the club I wanted and I didn't get yearbook. The things that got me mad was it hurt and I couldn't change, like looks or money or popularity or things. She added that she didn't think Kirsten ever liked her and said, quote, I have a lot of inferiority feelings and really bad feelings about myself. People sent out messages and stuff and just all the stuff and she just seemed to sort of represent it. She could be really mean to loners and geeks. I remember mean things about her, but I couldn't ever think it was her fault. I just got angry, I guess. She said that she just panicked, that after Kirsten got out of the car, she got so scared that she followed her back to that house and attacked her on that porch because she was worried Kirsten was going to tell the other kids that she was weird, but she said she never meant to kill her. But the thing that sticks out to this, the thing that like seemed weird to me is even though she's confessing to this, she's confessing to murder. She didn't really seem to realize how serious this was because she thought she was going to have to go back to the school. She like asked the agent, like, am I going to have to go back to Miramonte? Because if I have to go back and people know, like, I would rather die. But she wouldn't die. She would be arrested and she would be charged with Kirsten's murder and everyone would know. Now Kirsten's parents were happy to have this, you know, unknown, well happy isn't the right word, they were lightly relieved to have this unknown answered. I mean, six months is a long time. They said they needed time to process this, but knowing that she was so young, they were like, we're, we're not gonna feel good if she goes to jail but gets out after just a short amount of time which is quite unfortunate foreshadowing, I will say, but her father said specifically of this, quote, I've thought of a number of things, but I can't seem to come up with any good conclusion because we've lost our daughter and she's gone and I don't know if I'll ever be able to lose that feeling. Now they were relieved when an arrest was made, obviously, but they had no idea who Bernadette was. They were like, I guess she knew her, but they definitely weren't friends. And her father just said that they always felt like whoever killed her was somebody who was jealous of her good looks and popularity, which seems to be spot fucking on. Now when news of Bernadette's arrest got released to the public, people were shocked. People could not believe it. They said that she was sweet, she was polite, she was an average girl, and they just couldn't believe that she could do something like this. A woman named Suzanne, who apparently Bernadette babysat for for six years, which seems wild because she was like 15, so she would have started babysitting at age nine or 10, which I did not know you could even leave nine or 10 year old children alone. When can you leave kids alone at home? I, I don't know what the law says about that, but she said that Bernadette was like great and she loved her and she said specifically, quote, this has to be a terrible mistake. I don't know who else I would trust my children to. She's full of grace, sympathy, and love. People were mostly just surprised because she had no reason to do this. She wasn't like a weird kid, you know what I mean? She was popular in her own way. She was involved in school activities. So when people found out she did this, they were very upset. Like at the school, the principal actually announced it over the speaker, which I was like, that's quite the way to announce it. But as soon as he, he or she, they, the principal did, people were crying. And other people felt like dicks because they had been pointing fingers at young girls who were not involved, which good, don't do that. <laughs> So the legal. After Bernadette was arrested, she was held in jail until like the trial was to begin. And, and the reason for her being held wasn't specified, but it is believed that it was to protect others from her, but mostly to protect her from others because people were fucking pissed. Pissed because of what she did, of course, but also probably pissed because she was going to be tried as a juvenile because she was only 15 at the time she committed this murder. She had the maximum, the max she could get would be being held in the California Youth Authority, which I believe is called something else now, in jail till she was 25 years old. So at this point, less than 10 years, that's the max she could get. In March of 1985, a now 16-year-old Bernadette was going to go to trial for the murder of Kirsten Costas, and she was going to be having her hearing before just a judge. She did not have a jury trial, and she clutched her mother's hand as she pled not guilty. 
Now, apparently Bernadette's attorneys thought that the whole trial was kind of pointless because they had tried to make a deal. They had went to the DA and Bernadette had agreed that she would plead guilty to second degree murder, but the DA had turned it down. And Kirsten's parents did support this. They supported going to trial because they were hoping that they could get Bernadette, um, get her found guilty for first degree murder, basically. But I don't know what the difference is in the in the sentencing would have been considering, I mean, 10 years for first degree really isn't much at all. So I can't even imagine how little it would be for second degree. The trial was the trial, you know, it was a very packed courtroom. It was so full that at one point, like some, some journalists had to flip a coin to see which of them was going to be able to go in. And like the day that the sentencing was going to be was going to be announced. People were lined up outside at 8 a.m. for a trial that started at 10 a.m. And it got so full that there were people like waiting outside, just waiting to see what happened. And then those that were inside had to stand up against the wall. People were sitting on each other's laps. The bailiff had to go through each day and make sure that they hadn't reached or went over capacity and kick people out. And they even had to have the fire marshal there to like help the sheriffs keep people back away from the courthouse. Bernadette's defense was that she had a profound issue with self, self, self worth and that the fight, the argument between her and Kirsten over the weed and the fear that Kirsten was going to tell people that she was weird caused her to snap and do something without thinking. The defense never tried to deny that Bernadette killed Kirsten. They instead said that there were a lot of mitigating circumstances surrounding this situation and said specifically, quote, this is a naive, unsophisticated young girl who later expressed horror at what she did and later opened her soul to the police department while on the verge of her own self-destruction. The fact that this was an impulsive act and not something that was planned in advance must be taken into consideration. He said that Bernadette was not trying to kill Kirsten. Instead, she was striking out at the very symbol of everything she wanted, but could not have and could not be. The defense also noted that Bernadette's confession letter to her mother showed how remorseful she was when she said, quote, don't ask me why or how could you? I need so much help and love. I don't know what to do. As this letter was read in court, Bernadette buried her head into the desk and just cried. She did that a lot. She really had trouble during the hearing. And at one point she just had her head on the desk and was like hitting the table saying over and over, I just couldn't let her tell. I just couldn't let her tell. This was a tough trial. It was obviously incredibly difficult for Kirsten's family, as I'm sure you can imagine. I don't see how anybody can maintain composure in that situation, though I know you have to. It just seems absolutely impossible. And I know that there were some breakdowns for sure. There was one point where like, what was this person? There was somebody for the court. I can't remember exactly what their, their title was, but they started talking about Kirsten and referred to Kirsten as Kristen. And her mother just screamed out like, her name is Kirsten. And then just broke down into like hysterical sobs. And then there was when the knife was shown, like Bernadette's mom fucking screamed and had to put her head down. And then when Arthur, the guy that like held Kirsten in his, in his arms testified, both families were just like in hysterics. Now the prosecution, as I said, was going after a first degree murder conviction. They believed that this was premeditated and that it was fueled and motivated by jealousy. They said that they don't believe that Bernadette ever was going to take Kirsten to that party. And like I said, they pointed out the fact that she was not dressed for a party as evidence that she wasn't planning to go to a party. They believed instead that she just wanted to punish Kirsten for being pretty and popular, basically. A lot of Kirsten's friends agreed, saying that Bernadette was desperate for acceptance. And because of that, they didn't believe her story because they didn't believe that Bernadette was the type of girl who would have turn down weed if Kirsten offered it because she so wanted to be accepted by Kirsten, which honestly is a good point. Obviously we don't know because we weren't there, but from everything that has been said about Bernadette, I feel like that kind of rings true that she would just do something that she didn't want to do if it would get her acceptance. Cause that's the one thing she craves so much. The prosecution just believed that this was heavily planned. She lied to her own family about where she was going. She lied to Kirsten's mom. She lured her out. She brought a knife and she attacked her. Ultimately, it was up for a lone judge to decide Bernadette's fate. And after a three day trial, the judge determined that the prosecution had not proved premeditation. And therefore Bernadette was found guilty of the lesser charge of second degree murder and sentenced to nine years in the California youth authority, only nine years. Now Kirsten's family was split on how they felt, or at least how they expressed themselves. Her mother was very upset. She said that her daughter's hopes and dreams were shattered the day that Bernadette attacked her and left her to die in the street. Her mother never believed 
that this was an accident, never believed that it wasn't premeditated, didn't buy the story about the knife and the vegetables, nothing. She had been very upset through the whole trial, obviously, and she just glared at Bernadette, who got to sit there surrounded by her mother and her sisters while she, Beret's only daughter, was dead. And she said of the verdict and the sentencing, quote, My heart is empty. I ache. I'm half a person. She will probably be given freedom in a few years. I ask the people of California, is this justice? Her father said he believed justice was served, but that he didn't agree with the punishment. He obviously didn't think it was long enough, but he did point out that he didn't think any sentence would feel long enough because his daughter was gone and she was never coming back. And some of Kirsten's classmates, Bernadette's classmates, agreed that it wasn't enough time. They said that they felt bad for Bernadette, but that no time was going to be enough time for what she did. Another said they felt sorry for her, but, quote, I still want her to get everything she deserves. She shouldn't be allowed to forget what she did. And it doesn't seem like she was able to forget about what she did, actually, because I read an article that said that when she confessed, when she was talking to the FBI agent, she told them that she often dreamt of Kirsten and that in the dream she would apologize to her and just kind of talk to her and that she knew she was in heaven which I personally find a little creepy. I'm not going to lie, especially considering like she seemed to be a little obsessed with her. I find that a little weird, but that's just me personally, my opinion. Don't come for me. <laughs> but anyways, when Bernadette left the courtroom to begin her sentence, she walked outside, flocked by a bunch of deputies to protect her from the crowd outside that swarmed her. Now, though her parents, Kirsten's parents, didn't get the justice that I believe they deserve for their daughter's murder. They did attempt to get some sort of compensation. In 1985, Kirsten's parents filed a lawsuit against Bernadette and Bernadette's parents, and it was a wrongful death lawsuit. The suit said that Bernadette's parents, Raymond and Elaine, were negligent and careless in their care and supervision of their daughter prior to the murder, and they were ask asking for an unspecified amount that would cover medical, funeral, and burial expenses that they in incurred, endured money that they had to spend due to their daughter being murdered. They also asked for income, like the income that they lost when they had to take off work because they were mourning the death of their daughter. Their attorney said that Bernadette's parents should have, quote, known of the dangerous tendencies exhibited by their daughter and the, quote, threat of bodily harm she presented to others. The attorney said in the suit, quote, Bernadette Prati knew or should have known of the close and loving relationship between Kirsten Costas and her parents, and the Costases sustained great emotional disturbance, anguish, and upset at her loss. The attorney for Kirsten's parents said that Bernadette's parents negligently and carelessly provided her the items that she was able to use in the commission of the murder, which I believe he was referring or they were referring to the, um, the knife and the car, which I don't know. I don't know if I agree that it was Bernadette's parents' fault because truly it doesn't seem like there was warning signs and it doesn't seem like they had any idea that she could or did do something like this. She didn't seem like the type of kid you needed to watch out for. But I also 100% see how Kirsten's parents would just like need somewhere to put this blame and this hurt because like what else are you going to do? Their only daughter was gone. And while Bernadette was in jail behind bars, her life did continue. She went on to graduate high school with a 4.0, then went on to get a college degree and was considered a model prisoner. In 1990, she came up for parole and the DA fought it aggressively, saying that this just simply was not enough time. Kirsten's family obviously opposed this release, sending a letter to the local paper and also reaching out to family and friends, getting them to oppose it as well. By this time, her family no longer lived in the area. They had moved out of Arinda and moved out of the county. They went to Hawaii, putting as many miles as they could between them and the place their daughter was killed. And I believe by this time, Bernadette's family had also moved as well, which makes total sense, because how are you just going to like hang out and live in the place where your child did something like this? It seems very difficult. But anyways, her parole was denied at this point. She came up for parole again in 1991, but it was denied with the Youth Offenders Board, like one of the people saying that she had not yet learned how to control the rage that led her to murder Kirsten Costas in the first place. They were like, you haven't learned how to control your jealousy and your rage, so you can't leave, which is, t I think, telling. But then the following year in 1992, Bernadette was up for parole again. And this time, in a two-to-one vote, 23-year-old Bernadette Prati was given parole after just seven years behind bars and was released on June 10th, 1992, which just devastated Kirsten's parents. 
Beret was just, just without words. She was like, do people really just not believe in punishment anymore? And it was especially frustrating for people because like Bernadette never said why she never came out and said what drove her to do what she did. She never explained herself. She never explained why she had chosen to murder another 15 year old child. And despite that, she was just released. And Kirsten's father, Art, said that her release clearly shows that Bernadette Prati got away with murder in California. Which, man, it really doesn't seem like enough time to me, right? Like, even the DA at the time, or not the DA at the time, a DA, someone who became a DA in the county said that this type of crime should have merited more time. There should be exceptions to the minimums in cases like this. And it's just like seven years. That's such a small amount of time for killing a child. Even if you are a child yourself, it reminds me so much of the case we just covered, the Rick Ennis case, which if you haven't seen, you should. It's the recent two-parter I did because there was just so much information. And he was a minor when he killed two people and then served, I think, didn't he serve seven years? I think he served seven years also and then was released and then killed another person, which if you haven't seen that two videos, you should. It's, it's absolutely crazy, but it's just like with this case where it just, it doesn't seem like enough time. It doesn't seem fair. And I know life's not fair, but like there should be a little fairness in this. Like I feel so bad for Kirsten's family, but let me know if you disagree. If you think that this was enough time, because I know there are a lot of people out there that feel very compassionate towards Bernadette. So I'm sure there are some people who feel like that was a fair sentence, but you know, let me know what you think down below. Bernadette got to go out and have a life. You know what I mean? Like she got a college degree in jail. She was released and moved with like a family member in Oklahoma and people online were able to find her and find that she changed her name and continued getting more schooling. She got married. She got to be a mom. She got to do all the things that Kirsten never got to do. And Bernadette's mother got to watch her daughter grow up, got to become a grandma, all things that, you know, Bray won't get to do, not from her daughter, because this was her only daughter. You know, it's just really sad. This case was very publicized, right? And it still seems to fascinate a lot of people. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. First, the nature of the crime itself, the age of the, the victim and the killer, the reasoning or motive or lack thereof, which we're going to discuss a little more later. And the fact that it inspired, this murder inspired a bunch of different types of media, songs, movies, etc., etc., etc. Most popularly was the movie I saw as a kid, a lifetime movie called Death of a Cheerleader, or sometimes it's also called A Friend to Die For. There was another movie that came out first, but this was the most popular, probably because it was starring you know, Tori Spelling. And I watched it years ago when I first covered this case. And I did not this time because though it's portrayed somewhat accurately, I do not agree with the way it portrayed the person, the character that's supposed to be Kirsten. I think it honestly, now that I'm older and I've had more time, I don't know. Like the first time I watched it, I didn't really think of it. The first time I covered this case, I don't even know if I really thought about it. But when I'm thinking about it now, I think it was done in poor taste. I find the reaction that I see, the response to Kirsten's murder, the the portrayal of her, like in articles and in comments that I've gotten, shocking. Because people blame her. They say that she was a bully, a dick, an asshole. And let's say that all that's true. I don't condone bullying at all. I think that's fucking lame. But let's say it's true. Let's say that she was a bully. Let's say that she was a dick. Let's say that this 15 year old girl was an asshole. Did she deserve to be stabbed to death for it. I find people who say that fucking crazy. I'm sorry. I do. I think that's, that's batshit crazy. But anyways, that movie death of a cheerleader, a friend to die for ended up getting a reboot more recently. So the younger generation could be, you know, it could appeal to a younger generation and even more people now know about this case. There was even a song written about the murder called death of a cheerleader by Marcy playground. That's lyrics say in part quote, she was so pretty. Everyone said the more so the pity that she was found dead, which is just very sad. Now, why, why did Bernadette kill Kirsten? That really is the question. And I think what it boils down to is shame and judgment, but shame about what I think is the real question. I don't know if I believe the whole weed story, to be honest, like I could see Kirsten smoking weed. I could even kind of see Bernadette turning down weed. Like, I don't think it's likely, but I could see her turning down weed, but I don't think I can see her being so terrified that Kirsten's going to tell people she's weird 
for not smoking weed, that she'd go out and stab her to death. To me, that reasoning doesn't line up and it just feels a little drastic. There are other theories though of what may have happened. I'm going to tell you about one of them because it's one that was mentioned in enough articles that I think it's worth at least mention. There are a lot of people who around that time and even now think that it's possible that the reason Bernadette freaked out and what she was hiding and didn't want Kirsten to tell was that perhaps Bernadette was gay, which hear me out. There is an unaccounted for amount of time, about 30 minutes from when she picked her up, that they would have been hanging out in the church parking lot, that people believe it's possible that the two were talking and that Bernadette maybe made a pass at Kirsten. They believe that that's why Kirsten referred to Bernadette as acting weird and being weird, and that that's why Bernadette panicked so badly and couldn't let Kirsten tell, because at that time, it really wouldn't have been received well if Bernadette was gay. These theories were sort of strengthened because during Bernadette's confession, she talked about a secret, a secret that she was scared that Kirsten was going to tell. But in this same, you know, interview, she denied there being any specific issue saying that she was just scared of the popular kids, her friends talking about her. But at the same time, during her confession, Bernadette may have, you know, protested too much because during the same questioning, she offered up the information that she was not a lesbian and that if that's what they were thinking, they should change their mind because she wasn't attracted to girls. And like, I don't think anyone was asking. So it's like, why would she just say that? She was asked, like, do you have a boyfriend? And she said no, but then quickly added, but I'm attracted to boys. So that with the fact that her immediate concern was what would be in the press, what people would know and what they would think. I just think that that's interesting. People think that it's very possible that Bernadette made a pass at Kirsten, that she was feeling like she may like girls and thought that because she liked Kirsten and because Kirsten was friendly and hugged people that maybe she tried to kiss her and that Kirsten freaked out and was young and immature and could have said that she was going to tell people. And that with that Bernadette panicked because in the eighties being gay was just looked at so differently. I mean, fuck people to this day are still shitty about it. It's like, it's, grow up. (laughs) I'm sorry. I just, we all know how I feel, but I don't know. I don't know if I think it's true. I know investigators didn't, you know, pursue it much or didn't take it seriously. They said they followed a lot of leads, but that there was no evidence that any sexual activity had happened between the girls. But at the same time, there wouldn't really be a sign of anything if it had just been a pass that was turned out. So who knows? What I do know is that Kirsten is dead. And I think an article I read, I read this article in People Magazine, and I think they said it best when they said of the murder of Kirsten Costas at the hands of Bernadette Prati, quote, the one person whose acceptance meant so much, the one she so desperately wanted to talk to, has tragically been silenced forever. And with that, that my friends is the story of the tragic murder of Kirsten Costas. I hope that you found my telling to be informative. I hope it made sense. I hope it is just so much better than last time. And of course, I just want to thank you for remembering Kirsten with me today. Now, considering everything I told you throughout this video, I want to revisit the question or questions of the day. And that were these, those were these, these are them. What do you believe happened that day in that car between Bernadette and Kirsten? What do you believe caused Bernadette to attack her like she did? And do you think she meant to kill her? Or do you really think she just wanted to hurt her and that this was like a tragic accident with a giant knife? That's a little bit of a leading question, but you know, let me know all your thoughts in the comments below because I am curious about, I I can hear other people's opinions as long as they're respectful. You know what I mean? Like I'm not one to just, you have to agree with me or you're out. I'm just genuinely curious about what you think. But anyways, guys, before you leave, please let me know down below what case you'd like to see me cover in the future. As you know, I have a long list of cases and whenever you leave me a suggestion, I put it on my list with your name next to it. So if I cover it, I can give you a shout out. I love looking into the cases you guys suggest because they're often cases I haven't heard of or cases that need more coverage. And I know you're filled with great ideas and great taste. Otherwise you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below along with a link to, along with a link to my membership and a link to my merch store. And now with all that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. 
you are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday, and I hope to see you in my next video.